building a simple computer based on the 6502 processor, and in previous videos we got it working and actually displaying some text, but then when we tried to simplify the code to use subroutines, it stopped working. And it stopped working because when the computer jumps into a subroutine, it pushes the return address onto the stack, which is in memory. And at the end of the subroutine, it pulls that return address off the stack so it can jump back from where it came. Our problem is that our computer didn't actually have any RAM in it, so in the last video, I started hooking up this RAM chip here, and I've got the 15 address lines, the green wires here, hooked up to the address bus, the eight data lines, the blue here, hooked up to the data bus, and the write enable pin, which is this yellow wire underneath here that goes all the way over, hooked up to the read write pin on the microprocessor. And so that's hooked up pretty much like this. We've got the 15 address lines, we've got the eight data lines, and we've got the read write or write enable signal hooked up here. But then the RAM chip's got a couple of control signals here as well to enable it. And for that, we said, well, we can hook those up to address 14 and 15 so that when both of those are low, the RAM is enabled. And that'll ensure that the RAM is enabled anytime the address is between uh, 0000 and 3FFF, which is the range we want to use for the RAM. But then in the last video, we took a closer look at the timing diagram for the RAM to take a closer look at the timing requirements uh, for, for interfacing with it. And then we looked at the timing diagram for the microprocessor as well, and just kind of the interaction between these two. And so that was, that was in the last video. And what we found is that this wouldn't actually work quite like this. Instead, we'd have to add a little bit of logic here. And this is to ensure that the chip select uh, signal doesn't go low until all of the address lines are, are set and stabilized. And then the chip select signal would go high before any of the address lines change, anytime we're doing a read or a write, uh, or particularly a write to the RAM. And so that's what this additional logic here does and in my last video, I went over exactly why uh, we needed this. So in this video, let's hook this, uh, this extra logic up and uh, see if we can get the RAM working. And I'll start with uh, address 14 and hook that around to the output enable. So address 14 is this pin here, and we're gonna hook that to output enable over here. And so this will ensure that the RAM is not gonna output anything unless address 14 is low, which it has to be if we're addressing anything in that zero through three FFF address range. Then we need to hook up the chip select and the chip select is going through these logic gates. Now, conveniently, we already have uh, one of the logic gates hooked up already because we have this address 15 uh, being inverted through a NAND gate like this that we already did for the chip select for the, the ROM. And so address 15 is, is coming down here, and this is actually address 15 here, and it's connected, I don't know if you can see, it's connected to both inputs of, of one of these NAND gates, and then the output here is, uh, is going back up around to chip select for the ROM but we can reuse that to go to one of the inputs of this other NAND gate. So I'll just hook from the output of that first NAND gate to one of the inputs of the next NAND gate with just a little tiny jumper there. So that's that connection there. And then this NAND gate, the output of that will go to the chip select of the RAM. So that's gonna be the output of this NAND gate here and it's gotta go all the way around to the uh, chip select input of the RAM. And I've got a nicely measured wire that I need to somehow feed through here. And there we go. So we've got one of the inputs going into this NAND gate, and then we've got the output going around to the chip select over here. And then the other input is going to be our clock signal. And I've already got the clock signal hooked up here, uh, coming from the you know, clock pin of the processor around to the clock input down here of the uh, interface adapter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually pull this, this longer wire out and replace it with two shorter wires so we can uh, drop it into this uh, NAND gate input here as well. So I'll pull that clock wire out and we'll come from the processor down to that input on the NAND gate. And then I'll have another shorter wire that goes from that input of the NAND gate around to the interface adapter clock. So there we go. So that restores that same connection we had before, but now we also have a clock input going into the NAND gate there. So now I'm using three of these NAND gates and I'm not planning to use the fourth NAND gate. And it's a good practice when you're not using inputs to tie them you know, either high or low. So they're not floating and, and uh, potentially you know, hovering between high and low and causing the chip to switch on and off, and, and which could introduce noise and such into, into the rest of the circuit. So it's just a good practice to tie those unused inputs high. So go ahead and do that. But with that, you know, we've got, let's see, we've got address 14 now hooked to output enable. We've got address 15 uh, already was being inverted by this first NAND gate. And now that's going into the second NAND gate as well as the clock going to the second NAND gate. And then the output of that NAND gate is coming all the way around here to chip select. So with that, we should now have RAM in our computer, which also means we should now have a stack in our computer. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and try to power it up and see if our program works, because if we have a stack, our program ought to work. 
So I'll plug this in and see our clock is running. We will reset. And yeah, there we go. Our program's working. And I haven't changed the, the program in the ROM, so it's using the jump to subroutine instruction and and, the, and obviously the return from subroutine instruction, which is what wasn't working before. And it appears to be working now, which which is great. So yeah, let's take a closer look at that. Let's uh, let's get this out of the way and I will hook the uh, Arduino back up so we can actually monitor step by step and see that stack operation again, uh, but this time actually see it work. So I'll power this off, get the Arduino back here, and I'll, I'll hook the Arduino up again to, to monitor everything. So like before, I'll start by hooking up all 16 of the address lines to 16 inputs of the Arduino, and then we'll hook up another eight inputs to, of the Arduino to eight of the data lines. And then we'll hook up the read-write signal from the processor to, to another input, and of course, hook up the clock to another input on the Arduino to, to trigger it. And then finally, uh, we need a, a common ground. All right, so that's all hooked up and it's pretty annoying to hook up, I have to say. But uh, in any event, I will uh, hook up the Arduino to the computer and power up the computer, other computer. <laughs> Hit reset here. And our program's running, but I'm gonna uh, actually hold down reset and stop the clock. That way we'll be able to single step through this and uh, see what's going on. So here's the output of the Arduino serial monitor and I'll go ahead and clear that. And this Arduino program that I'm running will actually let us see what's on the data and, and address buses for each clock cycle. And you can check out a previous video where I talk more about how it works. So anyway, I'll step through the first seven clock cycles to let the processor initialize itself. And then the next two clock cycles, reading FFFC and FFFD, that reads the uh, reset vector, which is uh, uh, 8000 and we'll jump to 8000 and we'll start reading instructions. So A2 is the load X and then FF, so that loads FF into the X register. And this is initializing the stack pointers because the next instruction is gonna be our transfer X to S and that's uh, 9A is the opcode for that. And then we get to uh, A9, which is load A. And actually we see this repeated because really what's happening here is the transfer X to S takes two clock cycles so this first clock cycle where it looks like it's reading A9 from address 8003, that is what happens to be on the bus, but I think it's still executing the transfer X to S instruction on that clock cycle. And it's on this next clock cycle where it's actually reading the load A, uh, because then it's gonna follow up with load A FF, which is actually the next instruction. Then we have um, 8D, which is store A, and that's uh, store A6002, which is the address for DDRB. So this is all just part of the initialization. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly just to get to the point where we're actually calling and returning from the subroutine, since I've already shown a lot of this in previous videos. Uh, but anyway, we're, next we're gonna have a, uh, well, this is actually the write, uh, so it's actually writing the uh, FF to address 6002. Now we're gonna read uh, load A, E0, and then store A, 6003, and so now it's gonna store the E0 at address 6003. Then we have a load A38. So that's the first instruction that we're actually gonna to send to the LCD. So the next instruction now is going to be the, the jump to subroutine. Opcode 20 is jump to subroutine. And then the address of that is going to be 8060. Or no, it's not 8060. This actually kind of fooled me because uh, the 60, it's reading from you know address 8010. That is gonna be part of the address that we're jumping to. But you can see this 80 is actually being read from 101FF, uh, one and that is going to be the bottom of our stack because the FF, remember, that is our stack pointer. And so actually what we should be doing is now that we're pointing at that stack, we should be writing, yes, 8011 into the bottom two positions of the stack, so 01FF and 01FE. And now we're reading from 8011, and so the 8060 is in fact the address that we're jumping to for the subroutine, it's just that by a pure coincidence, the address 01FF happened to have uh, 80 in it. Uh, and so that, that kind of uh, uh, fooled me there <laughs> for a minute. And it's a little bit confusing because there's two things going on here. I talked about this in the last video, but uh, you know we're, we're jumping to subroutine. So this 20 is the instruction to jump to subroutine. And then it, it needs to read the address that we're jumping to. So it reads from the next address, 8010. So the, the, the instruction was in 800F. So then it reads from 8010 and 8011 it reads the address that we're jumping to, and so that's 8060. I was thrown off here because it also has to write the address that we're jumping from, which is 8011, and it's writing that to 01FF and 01FE, so it's pushing those onto the stack. And then there's this extra clock cycle in here where the bus is not being used, 
you know, there's something internally going on in the processor because you know the the jump to subroutine uh, takes an extra clock cycle for whatever reason internally. So the processor's not really reading uh, this value 80 from the bottom of the stack. It just happens to set the address lines to that value, and this happens happened to be what was in memory, uh, which which confused me there for a minute. Uh, but at any rate, we've got our return address pushed onto the stack 8011, and we've read the address that we're jumping to, you know, 8060. So we should now jump to 8060. And there we are, we're at address 8060, and we're reading 8D. And that's because we're down in the LCD instruction subroutine, and 8D is the, the first opcode for, for store A. So I'll uh, just go through this pretty quickly. So we have uh, a store A, 6000, which is port B. So there it is, storing the 38 into port B. Then we have a load A, 00. And so this is to clear the register select, read, write, and enable bits. And then store A, 6001, which is port A. And there it goes, storing zero into port A. Then we have a load A80, that's the enable bit, and store A6001 again. And there it is, writing that uh, out to 6001, so it's setting the enable bit. And then we have a load A00 to clear the enable bit, and store A6001. And there it is, writing that out again. And then we get to our return to subroutine instruction. So 60 is return from subroutine. And so at this point, it should read back those values that it stored on the stack. So it stored the return value 8011 on the stack at uh, you know, 01 FF and 01 FE. So it should pull those back off the stack. So let's see here. So it, it jumps ahead to eight, uh, 8073. And again, I think this is a, uh, a clock cycle that's being used internally. I don't think it's actually trying to read this next instruction. But now it goes to 01 FD, which is where the stack pointer is pointing. And then it reads from 01 FE and 01 FF. So again, I think these two clock cycles here, the processor is not actually using the bus. It's just those clock cycles are being used internally, and this just happens to be what's on the bus. But certainly for these two clock cycles here, we are reading the return address, 8011. And if you watched the last video before we had the RAM installed, this is where things fell apart because when we tried to read that return address back, well, it wasn't stored in the RAM because there was no RAM. And so the next instruction, we jumped off into some garbage address. But now we're reading the correct thing back, 8011, so we should see it jump to 8011 and continue executing. And so here we are at 8011. And notice that, you know, it jumps back to 8011, which is not actually the next instruction. This is, this is actually the last half of the address that we jumped to. So we're not quite at the next instruction, which is the load A. That's going to be at 8012. So if we keep going, here we are at 8012. So again, I think, you know, this is a little bit confusing the way that, that this monitor shows what's going on because it prints out what's on the bus for each clock cycle, even if that clock cycle is not actually transferring data on the bus. But nonetheless, I think we can conclude that this is working correctly because now here we are uh, at, at 8012, which is in fact the next load A. And so we should see that load A, 0E, which is the next LCD instruction that we wanna execute. And then we should again see another jump to subroutine uh, to the LCD, which is gonna be the 8060, and so there it is, reading the 8060 and also pushing the return address, which this time is 8016. And the bottom line is, if we let this run, as we saw before, it's just going to work because now we've got the RAM there. And because we have the RAM, we have a stack. And because we have a stack, our jump to subroutine instruction is going to work for us. So I think there are a few improvements that we can make to our Hello World program before we're completely done with this. One of them you can probably see right off the bat here is that we're not clearing the screen at the beginning. Um, you know, before it was working fine because when we first plug the computer in, the screen starts out cleared. But here, you know, I let the program run for a little bit and we stopped the clock and then I used uh, the reset to reset it. And as part of our reset sequence, we don't actually clear the screen. So let's go ahead and add that because that's a, a pretty straightforward thing to add. Well, if we take a look at the data sheet for the LCD module, we can see there's an instruction for clearing the display. And it's just all of the bits are zero except for the last bit, which is a one. And that's fairly straightforward to do. We just go down here with all of the other instructions that we're sending to the LCD and add another instruction to clear the display. And the instruction is just all zeros except for a one, and that clears the display. And so once we load that instruction into the A register, we just jump to the subroutine. And that's it, that should clear the display before we print our message. So I'll save that, and I'll switch over to the terminal and run our assembler to assemble that program into binary. And this will output a file a.out with the binary that we need to put on the EEPROM. And we can take a look at what's on that binary if we want. There's our program. And so now we need to program that onto the EEPROM that's uh, buried in here. So what I'm gonna do is disconnect all of this because I don't think I'm gonna be using this monitor again in this video. So I'll get that out of the way. And then I can carefully remove the EEPROM. 
carefully <laughs> and put it in the EEPROM programmer. Being, again, careful to put it in the right place in the EEPROM programmer. And then we'll go ahead and write this to the EEPROM. And so it's writing that to the EEPROM. And there we go, it's done. So let's pull the EEPROM out, carefully put it back in our circuit. There we go. And now let's power this up. And we should get a hello world message. Reset. Hmm, something's not working quite right here. What's going on? And it looks like my clock fell out. How about that? Let's plug that back in. And there it goes. And we can speed this up. And if I reset, it should clear and reprint it. Beautiful. And so there we go. We've got working uh, working RAM in our computer, uh, which means we've got a working stack, which means that our program that uses subroutines uh, is working. Um, and as you can see, it was easy, uh, easy to add another instruction to the LCD to get it to clear just by adding another subroutine call. So that should make uh, programming this thing a lot easier. And in fact, there are some more improvements I want to make to the program for Hello World. So, you know, even six videos in, I'm still not done with uh, <laughs> writing a basic Hello World program, but, you know, what do you want from me? I assume if you've been watching the last half hour of timing diagrams, you're probably okay with the situation. Um, but anyway, in the next video, I'm going to add some more improvements to the program and also get rid of our clock module here and replace it with our one megahertz uh, uh, crystal oscillator clock so that our computer will actually be running at the speeds that we talked about when we looked at the timing diagrams. And so there'll be a few more interesting things that we'll have to think about when we do that. And remember, if you're interested in following along with these videos, you can get all the parts I'm using over at my website, eater.net slash 6502. I've got the base computer kit as well as everything else you need to follow along with these videos. So you can check that out at eater.net slash 6502. And of course, as always, I want to thank all my patrons. Your support is a huge part of what makes these videos possible. So thank you.